Okay, good morning. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome everyone to the uh, New Education and Wellness Committee. Uh, previously, this committee was two committees, the Wellness Committee and the Education Committee. And as of February, at our February 2012 board meeting, a motion was made to move Wellness Committee into Education Committee, creating the Education and Wellness Committee. So I guess because in alphabetical order, the alphabetical order is education, I guess that's why I'm sharing this instead <laughs> after just so. Um, but I'd like to remind you to all silence your cell phones and please your Blackberry's off as well. They um, reverberate and they uh, add static and I think we have enough ad additions that we don't need any more noise. So um, I'd like to um, remind everyone also that there are public speaker slips in the back. If anyone would like to fill one out, they're more than entitled to speak. And uh, Mr. Shunky has raised his hand and he's, he's happy to collect them. So if you'd give them to him, I would appreciate it. And um, now I would like to call this meeting to order and ask Mr. Wood to please take the roll. Good morning. Dr. Carrier, here. Ms. Chang. Here. Dr. Diego. Here. Dr. Dirso. Here. Dr. Levine. Here. Dr. Salmonson. Here. Ms. Shipsky. Here. And Ms. Jaroslavsky. Here. We Thank you very much. <clears throat> so the next item of the agenda is um, public comment for anything that's not on the agenda. So I've got a list of uh, people that would like some time to speak. And I'd like to remind you to keep your comments, please, between two and three minutes and try not to duplicate what I've heard previously. And we will first call on uh, Robert Bonakdar, and I apologize for the mispronunciation, but I'm sure it's not the first time. Good morning, I'm Dr. Bonakdar from Scripps Clinic in San Diego. Um, I'm a family physician there and I'm here as an observer and to introduce myself to the board. Um, my uh, work in the area of physician wellness uh, comes from my mentorship with the late Dr. Uh, Lee Lipsenthal, whose uh, work is highlighted in the article that I work with Deb Nelson to contribute to this uh, issue, this uh, most recent issue of the Medical Board Newsletter, as well as my time with the Scripps Physician Wellness Committee. Uh, as part of that committee, we are tasked, um, similarly to uh, some of the people here, to find additional resources um, for our busy clinicians. We have five hospitals, 500 plus physicians. And uh, one of the things that we're working on now is a uh, CME, fall CME series, uh, which will be webcast across the five hospitals, as well as after the fact available as a web module that we want to make available to other California um, physicians and clinicians to help promote awareness of physician burnout and the continuum with uh, wellness to burnout. Uh, so I'm here uh, mostly to say uh, I uh, look forward to supporting the work of the Education and Wellness Committee and uh, I look forward to learning more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Burton Goldberg. I'm a patient advocate. I'm in the book of Suzanne Summers on knockout. I'm here to talk about cancer and the ability of physicians in California to practice alternative and integrative cancer treatment safely. Right now they're being castigated. And the purpose of Suzanne Somer's book called Knockout, which she devotes a chapter to me, is all about the doctors who are being castigated around the country as well as in California. And I have to send my patients quite often to Mexico or Nevada or Arizona. The difference between the integrative cancer care and conventional cancer care is enormous. We feel that losing your hair and regurgitating is not the way to treat cancer. And we pay attention to the causes of cancer, particularly dentistry because as much as 95% of females with breast cancer have a dental involvement, the oral cavity. 
And because through the meridian system, which is really not recognized by most medicine, uh, the paces of acupuncture, uh, and the nervous system, there's a connection between organs and system. We pay attention to diet. So I'm here to advocate that we allow holistic physicians to practice in their own school and perhaps put people on your board who understand alternative medicine. Thank you. I, by the way, uh, one of these will be delivered to all of you. Uh, this is a DVD I did, which will explain. And it shows in here th that we can use chemotherapy, but we use it totally differently. We know in advance which chemo will target the circulating tumor cells, which are the major killers. So it's really important. Thank, Thank you very much. I want to remind public speakers that this is an opportunity for you to speak to this committee as well as to the board when you're in public session. It's not really a, a conversation, so don't take anything personally that we don't respond to what your comments are, but we're very interested in hearing from the public, so thank you. Call um, Ginny Cuny, please. Good morning. Like you heard that name, I'm Frank Cooney's sister. It's the first time I've been able to attend a board meeting here. Welcome. Thank you. I've been with his group from the get-go, and I have a very thorough background in uh, alternative health for years. Um, my husband died of brain cancer. He had the same kind of Senator Kennedy did. And unfortunately, he, he, well, he was VA, so he couldn't have any alternative. I spent <coughs> numerous hours on the internet and talking to people and spending a lot of money trying to find some alternative. And I did do a lot of things. I did do a lot of diet and a lot of stuff like that. But that kind of cancer, you know, is very difficult. Yeah, I mean, if anyone could, could have been cured, probably Senator Kennedy could have been. But anyhow, I'm here to suggest that we really have some, like Dr. Burton, Mr. Burton was talking about, we really need some alternative stuff, diet and other types of things to help these these people. It's a horrible thing to watch your loved person die of cancer. It's really bad. Thank you. Thank you very much. Frank Cooney, welcome. Thank you. My name is Frank Cooney. I'm the director of California Senior California Citizens for Health Freedom. And uh, first, I would like to comment that you have a book we gave to each of you, Return to Healing, written by Dr. Saputo. And the particular section in there dealing with pain, which is a complete alternative to drugs and a very effective program, I would recommend that you read very carefully and look at it because that, those type of treatments are not generally accepted and covered by insurance, but they should be covered by insurance. The second is to comment on the cancer. I would like this committee and the board to seriously consider sponsoring a cancer freedom bill for next year. There are two, over 2,000 citizens of California that go to Mexico each year. There are numbers of citizens who go to Arizona, Nevada, and of course a great number go to Cancer Treatments of America. We could have Cancer Treatments of America, I assume, in California. There are several programs in Mexico that are run by California licensed physicians. They'd like to practice in California. We increase the number of physicians here. We increase the number of treatment modality that would be here. And we'd also increase the economic status within California and, and have a more helpful situation that people do not have to leave California to go for treatment. And I urge you to seriously consider that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Robert Rowan is the name that's printed. The signature that I can't really read is different. You're the same person as the signature. Okay. Yes. Uh, my name is Robert Rowan. I am one of your licensees, and I am an integrative physician. And I am here to tell you that it is very frustrating that in this state of California, where there is some tolerance for integrative medicine under the board, there is a law that makes the integrative treatment of cancer a crime. And I think it's abhorrent that patients have to go to Mexico, as Mr. Cuny said. 
I had right in front of me an article about the contribution of cytotoxic chemotherapy to five-year survival in adult malignancies in the USA and in Australia. It contributes nothing at all. Yet in California, it mandates that only chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery be used for cancer. Otherwise, you're a criminal. I have also for you at least two cases of stage four cancer signed by patients themselves imploring you to sponsor legislation <clears throat> that will repeal this draconian law. One patient was an Indian Swami, 76 years old, on death's door, literally on death's door, and his devotee behind me will confirm this. He was seen by an integrated physician with only weeks to live with stage four colon cancer, huge mets to the liver, dying. He's alive today, totally cancer free his doctor could be held criminally responsible for getting him better. There's another patient here who signed a letter. He had stage four malignant melanoma. He is now cancer free, integrated strategies. His doctor could also be held criminal under current California law. In California, a 14 year old girl has a greater right to get an abortion without her mother's knowledge or consent. This is a minor child we're talking about than you do, ma'am, to get the breast cancer treatment of your choice. I believe that is not right and something has to change. And I'm here to beg on behalf of patients and California citizens that this board sponsors legislation to repeal the law. I will leave these cases for you. Thank you very much. Maya Lofuru, and I apologize. Okay. I know it's a tough name. It's Maya Lohuaru. I got the first half. Thank you. So I took care of um, the Swami that Dr. Rowan was talking about. I was his caregiver, and he was at death's door for certain. The uh, doctors who were caring for him said there was nothing more they could do for him and they refused to give him any more treatment. No, you know, they said he was too weak for chemo or radiation. So we wouldn't give up so we looked for integrative therapy and he immediately started improving. Immediately. And day by day he got better. He was um, bedridden, they, you know, from six to eight weeks to live. He was um, starting to walk again. He got out of his own wheelchair and he was able to walk into the integrative doctor's office. And from there, he's completely cured. This is two years ago. So I obviously am for integrative care. Um, I would ask that the laws be changed in California so that people could benefit from the integrative care. <clears throat> because it was hard to find, for one thing. It was hard to find a doctor who would treat him. So um, this has been my personal experience. And I would like more people to be helped by this integrative care. So I really appreciate being able to speak about it. Thank you very much. Lori Gregg. I have a Dr. Lori Gregg, welcome. Dr. Gregg, it's good to see you. Good to see you all. Former member of the Medical Board of California. Keep doing your good work, it's easier to sit out in the audience. Uh, I just want to come here and um, speak a little bit on wellness, uh, being a former Medical Board member and also um, one that brought the Wellness Committee into fruition. Currently, I'm uh, the chair of American Congress of OBGYNs in California. We have an active wellness committee and I also serve on my hospital well-being committee. And I really think it's in the mission of the medical board to keep the wellness um, portion going. You know, we certainly know from studies that a healthy, happy physician leads to more optimal care. We have a lot of studies showing the opposite, that an unwell physician, a burnt out physician has more medical errors, that a fatigued physician can create harm to the patient. So I'd really encourage you to continue to work on that. Um, a couple of suggestions on ways to do that is the medical board articles are excellent and I encourage you to um, continue those. There's a lot of resources in the wellness community to do that. 
Um, also, um, building a list of resources or educational materials is one way you could do that. Um, partnering with the AMA, who has an active uh, physician uh, wellness committee, and also the CMA to uh, create resources on the national and state level. Uh, and one thing with um, being an active member of the well-being committee is we find that we're a little busier doing some monitoring since the diversion program closed. And so I think one way we might be able to help those committees is by creating a resource guide or toolkit to help them be more proactive with um, uh, maintaining physician wellness or recognizing unwellness in their colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm going to ask for an approval of the minutes from the uh, January 27th, 2011 Education Committee. So moved. Second? Second. Do I have any public comment on the um, minutes or do I have any changes or additions? So seeing none, then all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? So item number five is a presentation. Disability insurance covers non-work related illness or injury. We also cover in the additional, in the initial phase of a, of a workers' comp kind of claim while that's being adjudicated. But it does include surgery, alcoholism, drug addiction treatment and recovery, pregnancy, childbirth, and other related uh, disabilities. So here again, we see the regular and customary work is, re is the standard. And what's very important to this community is that um, employees must be under the care of a physician or a practitioner who has to certify to the illness or disability. 
And this is just the difference between disability and impairment. Um, in paid family leave, this covers for only six weeks, but the rates are the same rate as at disability insurance. There's two types of paid family leave. The first one is for bonding, which requires written proof of a new child, such as a birth certificate, adoption papers, or foster care placement. Um, it must be claimed within 12 months of the child entering into the family, um, and the child must be under 18 years of age. The other type, which involves you as physicians more, is to care for a seriously ill spouse, registered domestic partner, parent, or child, and a doctor's certificate of the seriousness of the illness and the need for care is required as part of that. It's also so um, required to be signed by the patient um, or their representative. And mothers uh, bonding with their child don't have to do a second seven-day waiting period. It, go, it rolls over from their uh, disability from their pregnancy right into the bonding period. So this, is the diff this identifies the differences between disability and paid family leave, that disability insurance is up to 52 weeks per claim, and paid family leave is only up to six weeks. Um, I will be talking later about um, elective coverage, which is something that many physicians can have to cover themselves when they're a, a, a self-employed, and that covers up to 39 weeks. So the, specific, the claim forms are specific between disability and paid family leave, and the claimants can um, get the forms. Now the disability is downloadable, but the paid family leave is in an optical character recognition form, so that has to be mailed, and the doctor's certificate is part of it. Um, not only doctors are um, able to certify, we do allow some other practitioners, including nurse practitioners. This is just a quick shot of the form for um, disability insurance and the um, one page is basically um, the doctor's certificate. So when you're certifying, the parts that you need to put in are the, um, your certification, whether you're an MD or a DO, et cetera, um, the license number, and then what's very important is the estimated return to work date, the ICD-9 code and diagnosis. I've been finding that I think a lot of people are putting down the chief complaint rather than the diagnosis. We have a very high rate of pregnancy incidental, which is not going to work much longer <laughs> because as a primary diagnosis. In its nature, it's not a primary diagnosis. So I would like to have physicians start really paying attention to what's happening with the coding. I know that many times this is delegated and it's very important to make sure that the that it's not just a symptom that's listed, that it's a that it's a diagnostic code and not just a symptom. We do have a um, place for um, secondary ICD-9 codes and um, comorbidities to be included. There's space to explain more about the nature, severity, and extent of the treatment of the in illness, the type of treatment, and if there's surgery or a procedure for pregnancy, it's a due date. If the, if the claimant is, continues to be ill or injured longer, um, it's fairly easy to extend it with documentation <coughs> that the illness or injury is extend, extending longer, but this requires a timely process, the extension has to be done within 20 days of the issue date. Um, you can also, there is a form that's sent out to you as a physician, um, but you can also get an extension just as long as you include your letterhead, 
the patient's name and social security number, the ICD-9 code and diagnosis, and the statement that the patient is still disabled when their recovery date is expected, your license, num uh, signature, and date. The paid family leave form, as I said, is, is in this red optical character recognition um, type form, but it's basically the same. In this case, um, what is being asked of the physician is the, you have to have the claimant's identifying information, but then um, you also need to put the necessity for care and the time involved, the daily hours of care. Um, that are required. For, um, to, for what we call duration management to try to um, be, have reasonable control over how long people are out on disability, we use a system, um, there's a website called MD Guidelines which has um, suggested durations. Um, we also uh, sometimes will get back to physicians, that's why I encourage all physicians to fill out the forms well in the first place so that it really identifies what the problems are so that you don't have to be called back and say, you know, ask why is this patient still out when clearly they're um, significantly seriously disabled but you just haven't shared that information. We do also have a process called the Independent Medical Examination or IME and we ask for uh, more IME panelists to join us for that. Um, so we are looking for more um, panelists to serve as uh, consultants to show that the uh, claim is still appropriate or not appropriate anymore. It's a it's not a pure second opinion because you're not giving a full um, uh, treatment plan or anything like that, but that is just a quality control check that we do. Then I wanted to um, talk to you briefly about elective coverage. You have to be self-employed or a sole proprietor with the intent to have your business for at least two years and it not be seasonable. It must be a major portion of your remuneration and you have to make at least 46, you know, 4,600 4, a year. So it's a very low bar. Um, for elective coverage, you have to have been covered for six months uh, prior to um, the claim, to filing a claim. And the amount of coverage is up to 39 weeks and you can automatically be also eligible for, pay, for the full paid family leave since that's shorter. Um, in, there's no pre-existing diagnosis uh, issues with elective coverage and I think you'll find that the coverage, though it's fairly low, will provide a, a baseline that's uh, quite inexpensive compared to other disability plans. And I've included separately from your, uh, I think Tim passed around the, the actual forms you need to fill it in to send it in if you are interested. We um, serve in both English and Spanish and um, soon we're coming, we're in the process of uh, automating. So I um, will be looking forward to um, having patients be able to put their uh, claims in online and then the physicians will be able to um, do online their um, process also. So um, are there any questions? Do you have any questions, Dr. Levine? So the, the program is essentially funded by employees. Yes, the program is funded by employees. They pay 1.2 percent of their salary and um, some companies have their own plans they have to be better than the state plan to have their own plan. But the, um, the elective coverage is something that, as a pathologist who always worked on contract, I would have, I would have um, qualified for, and I wish I'd known about that. <laughs> How do the revenues, that, the annual revenues, compare to the payouts? I mean, the funding status of the... Oh, uh, we're doing well. 
I don't have that off the top of my head. I've been looking at the medical side of things and not the financial side so much. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Diego? So just to clarify, the nurse practitioner can put somebody on disability without a doctor's signature. The physician assistants require a doctor's signature? Um, the, there is a form in your packet. The nurse practitioner's form is in there. Um, and then the nurse practitioner has to have a relationship with the physician, but the physician's assistant, I, you know, I'm not sure exactly how this happened, but physician's assistants can't do it. They have to have a physician sign it. Uh-huh. Um, and when a person goes for an extension, sometimes it happens that they started with some doctor and then the doctor says, you know, like cardiovascular surgeon says, go back to your primary and they can continue that. They, you know push aside the form, is that okay for the primary doctor to continue or should it continue with the doctor who initially initiated it? Uh, they can change if, you know, if it's appropriate in the care that they no longer need such um, specialized care, it's time to go back to a primary care doctor <laughs> that um, mm -hmm. they can take over, assuming they can take over in the status of I hate the to care. say this, the reason that I ask that is because oftentimes the uh, person will come to the primary care doctor who will fill out the forms with no dollars attached to it, but there are some places that charge for the forms. So provider's office. Oh, provider's offices are charging for it? Yeah, charging. That's why they'll come to the primary care doctor who will. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know about that. I, I'm new, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm <laughs> Thanks for reporting that. I'll uh, find out about that more later. So and are you suggesting, Dr. Diego, that, or Dr. Waters, that that might not be appropriate? I'm should not there be a sure about that, uh, that that should be charged separately. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to have to check into that and see, but I, I don't think that I mean, I think that that should be part of an exam uh, to, we're not know talking they, about big paperwork here, we're talking about a few lines. I, it can't take more than five minutes. Right. You know the Dr. Solomonson? Well, I'm just, you know, curious how to optimize, let's say, a, a new baby who has a birth anomaly, and then he's going to have, like, the first stage of reconstruction. So then the mom would like to stay home and take care of the baby and not treat over to daycare. How do those like three things, because it's kind of like the birth, the bonding, and then caring for the child. I guess I Dr. Salmon said, could you, excuse me, could you use your microphone please? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, just trying to figure out how those could be optimized. Well, normally after a vaginal birth we do six weeks and eight weeks after a cesarean section. Then there's six weeks for bonding. Oh good, that's on top of that. And then the six weeks for bonding though is in a 12 month running. Okay. So that um, whether she could do six weeks for bonding and then another six weeks for caregiving yeah, let's is say, a new question to me. I'll have to get back be, to you. Because us. typically I get the diagnosis I'm most familiar with this cut lip and palate, so the palate repair would be like at nine months of age. So should they save up their bonding time so they were around, or can they get that separate? Because actually we do get that question. I really, it's great to get somebody I can ask. Yeah, can I get your card? <laughs> or actually my card's in there. All right, perfect. Call I'll me a quick email, email. Okay. Uh, and um, I'll find okay. out about that because I know that PFL you're supposed to only get once in a 12 month rolling time. But if one's for bonding and then one's for caregiving, I don't know if that starts as, if that counts as a separate new one. It's, it's an interesting thought. So let me ask you the question to just clarify this presentation. That in order to have this insurance, you have to pay? You, right. In order to have this insurance, you not only have to pay, but you have to have been working a certain amount of time and generated a certain amount of um, positive cash flow to the tune of $4,600, correct? Uh, the $4,600 a year, mm -hmm. it's only a year, okay. is for, um, it, that's for the elective coverage. The, um, the regular coverage, it's only $300 a quarter. So what I'm basically asking though is that in order to have this insurance, you have to fill out the forms and be and proactive and have worked, correct? 
That's on you have time. you have to have word sum, and it's a complicated thing about when your base period is. So you don't. My my you. So uh, yes, okay. What what you're getting at is that if somebody has not worked at all, then they will not qualify. Uh, thank you. That's where I was going. But it doesn't take much. I, I I've got that. I just want to make sure that everyone was clear on the on the. Thank you. And there are um, evaluation forms in your packet. I would really appreciate if you would fill them out and I look for, you know, any um, feedback you have. Thank you. I want to thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Waters. Thank you for being here and uh, members, thank you. I'm going to move on to um, first an order of business and it's my error and I apologize um, when we did the approval of the minutes for the previous education committee. I did not ask for approval of the minutes from the wellness committee from November of uh, 2011. So I would ask for a motion on approving the wellness committee minutes from November of 2011. So moved. Second. Do I have any comments uh, from the public on the uh, motion and from any of the members of the committee? Ms. Chang, please. Well, so if I wasn't on the wellness committee, I probably shouldn't vote for that. I would have to ask a legal opinion. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, assume. It would be a writing recommendation since by action of the board, the, the two committees have been consolidated, that voting would be appropriate for any member of this committee. So the answer is you may vote. Or you may abstain. <laughs> so all those in favor of the motion as stated, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you. Uh, let's move on the agenda to item number six, uh, presentation on um, pre-existing condition insurance program. Uh, this pre-existing condition insurance program and education of physician is really important, I think, to the education uh, committee as well as to the consumers and the physicians around the state. Uh, it was something that was brought to my attention and I was shocked that this something that this even exists. So um, I hope that you find that the presentation from uh, the Deputy Director of California's Managed Risk Medical Insurance Board, Mr. Ernesto Sanchez, informative. And I want to welcome you uh, to our board, Mr. Sanchez. Um, and first let you all know that Mr. Sanchez has been staffed to the board since 1998. He has served as an Assistant Director for Healthcare Reform, Division Operations Manager, Special Project Section Manager in his current position. He administers five different programs that serve nearly one million subscribers with a combined budget of over $2.3 billion. You have a whole lot of money in your budget. Does anyone not, know about that? Not for too long. That's um, for sure. With the recent budget acts, but um, mm -hmm. thank you. We appreciate the opportunity, Madam Chair. Thank and you. board members to talk to you about Mr. Mib. Just give you a quick little background. Um, our, we were basically created in 1989 to promote access to affordable coverage, comprehensive, high quality, cost effective health care services that improve the health of Californians targeting the uninsured. We're a kind of a unique public board in that we sit under the Health and Human Services Agency, but we're independent. Our board members are appointed by the governor and the legislature, and we have four ex officio non voting members. Um, we oversee five programs, the newest being our pre-existing condition insurance plan, or PSIP as we know it, which is one of the probably first implementations of the Affordable Care Act. Um, it's meant as a bridge um, for those individuals who have been denied insurance coverage in the marketplace because of a pre-existing condition. It's expected and it's totally federally funded, very similar to the insurance exchange, states have the option to either state administer it or buy into the federal fallback. California felt we wanted to administer our own program to maximize the federal dollars. We were given an initial allocation of uh, out of $5 billion out there nationally, we were given $761 million. California is on, on a um, path to spend almost $1.2 two billion on, on the number of folks we have there. Our major risk program, which initially started our board back in 89, was the state's high risk pool. So we have both a federal and a state high risk pool. Um, from our perspective, the federal pool is better because the rates are lower and the benefits are more comprehensive. There are no annual limits and caps. We also administer California's CHIP program, which is known as Healthy Families, which covers 
nearly 900,000 children and has served nearly 3 million children since its initiation in 1998. We also oversee the Access for Infants and Mothers program that provides health coverage to women who are above the Medi-Cal level um, and they pay approximately 1.5% of their annual uh, income. And then we also um, administer a program through our CHIP funding to share some of our federal allocation with three county children's health initiative programs. Uh, on PSIP, we're going to go just give you a general overview of some of the demographics, eligibility requirements, and the application process. And I think with all of our programs, we appreciate the opportunity to collaborate with the medical board and providers because I think it works in two ways. It helps patients that you may be seeing now that are currently uninsured and have financial risk of the costs of care that they have to pay for out of their pocket. And secondly, for you, it provides a stable source of funding to fund those visits to your office and, and to the providers. Um, we started our program in October of 2010. Um, it's 100% federally funded, provides coverage to individuals who have had or have a pre-existing condition. Um, the Federal Affordable Care Act did require, though, that an individual be uninsured for six months, that you cannot have had credible coverage. And that was something that a lot of states lobbied against at the beginning because there are many people who might be in the state high risk pool that's a lot more expensive that can't afford to drop coverage. It wouldn't be wise uh, for their health. We currently spend about 6% on program administration. All the rest of the funds go directly to pay for care. As of our board meeting yesterday, we publicly reported that we passed the 12,000 enrollment milestone in the program. We are the biggest in the nation. Um, we expect that because we're California. On top of that, we're getting to the point where we're almost doubling the second highest state in the nation. So we're real proud of that and we continue to encourage folks to enroll in the PSIP program. Here's a quick uh, view of our demographics in the program. Requirements for this. You must be a California resident. You must be either a U.S. citizen, a U.S. national, or lawfully present in the country. Um, you must have a pre-existing condition, and, you, uh, and there's a couple different ways to document that. Uh, you cannot have had credible coverage, as we indicated, and you can't be enrolled in Medi-Cal, Medicare, uh, COBRA, or CalCOBRA benefits. Um, there's a couple different ways to document that you have a pre-existing condition. You can get a letter from a provider to document that, and we also have a form that you can download from our website as part of our application to make it easier. Um, you can have a denial letter from an insurance company that you've been denied individual coverage within the last year. Uh, you can also have been offered rates higher than the major risk program, the state high risk pool, PPL rates, and that will qualify you. And if you've been enrolled in credible coverage, you can get uh, a, a, another letter talking about how high the rates are that you've been offered. This is just our application. One of the things we've done since we run both high risk pools is we've combined our application. We want to make sure that if you're not eligible for the federal pool, which is a better deal for most folks because it's better coverage and cheaper, that you'll, you can also be looked at to see if you're eligible for the uh, state high risk pool, our Mr. MIP program. Who can apply? Individuals over 18 and over and parents can apply for their children. Uh, under the age of 18, legal guardians, step parents, foster parents, and some minors can apply for themselves. Um, generally, if we receive your complete application by the 15th of the month, your effective date of coverage will be the first of the following month. If it comes in after the 15th of the month, your effective date would be the first date of the second month. In the extreme cases where an individual has been enrolled with a effective date two months out, they can call in if they need immediate care and ask to have their effective date moved up to the first of the next month. Uh, it's a federal change that they just recently allowed us to do. Um, if you're denied for the PSIP program, as we said, we forward the application over to our Mr. MIP program to see if you're eligible for that. Um, basically, 
as what I was talking earlier, it's a win-win for both providers and the clients that they serve. Because if you're seeing a patient who is paying for costs directly out of their pocket, they may not be filling all their prescriptions. They may not be getting the follow-up care because they can't afford to pay for that. So I think it helps in a lot of different ways. And I think um, collaborating with the medical board is just a win-win for all of us to try to get our Californians insured, making sure that they're following the treatment plan that you provided for them. Here's some general numbers on our customer service. As you can see, we're open eight to Excuse eight. Me, Mr. Sanchez, let me just interrupt you. Members, what you've seen on the board is for clarification, it's all in your packets if you have it, so it came with your board materials. So I just didn't know, I wanted sure. everyone to. Yeah. Everyone's writing furiously. No, no, and you've got the handouts, and we have those for the audience in color also. Um, just to let folks know that we understand that there, a lot of our uh, patients are working population, so our uh, business hours Monday through Friday extend to 8 o'clock at night. We are also open on Saturday for calls. Um, if you're looking for some outreach material, because we have m m the main source where a lot of our referrals come to, from us are the denial letters and the insurance agents and brokers that help and assist uh, families in applying for individual coverage. We also have a vast network of what we call enrollment entities and uh, certified application assistants who have helped us in the Healthy Families Program, and they also are eligible for a reimbursement. Uh, both uh, the CAAs and the agents and brokers, if you help somebody apply and they're actually enrolled, get a $100 finder's fee uh, for enrolling somebody. Um, you can get information um, on the detailed benefits on our website. Um, quick overview of our other programs, our major risk program, as I indicated, is the other state high risk pool. Uh, we spend about 4% of our uh, funds on uh, administrative costs. Our current enrollment is at 6,000. It actually has been going down because most of our enrollees are going in, into the federal program. Um, just a quick eligibility requirements. The one thing is, the other, if, if you don't meet the federal requirements of being a uh, U.S. citizen, national, or lawfully uh, in, in, their, in the, the country, you can't, may be able to qualify for PSIP because the residential requirement is a little bit less than, than the other standard in the federal program. In general, it's the same idea of not uh, being able to secure coverage and been denied coverage. General application process, we have 30 days to process. One of the other things I wanted to cover a little bit because Mr. Mibbs involved with all these different programs that we've been pioneering a number of areas that are talked about in the Affordable Care Act and are assisting with the health benefit exchange that's coming on and looks to be in place by January of 2014. Um, we've used third party administrators to quickly administer our program to bring up new systems and provide first class quality customer service. We also have contract requirements that are comparable to commercial products on performance and accuracy, and we've been able to assure and, and provide multiple levels of quality assurance and auditing, because in almost all of our programs, there's federal and state funding, and we re also require our vendors to get the international certification on quality management. Um, one of the things with the Affordable Care Act and what the board has done for a number of years is to be consumer focused, um, looking to reduce the number of insured, strengthening the health care delivery system, working uh, to get us towards guaranteed issue so no, nobody can be denied for a health status. Um, we are very similar to what PERS does, which is we're not a regulator, but we are a purchaser of health care, and we try to, through our pools and providing subsidies for the cost of coverage to help people and buy the best quality service, we contract with both uh, Medi-Cal, plans. We also contract with commercial plans. We have 36 health, dental, and vision plans. And for the PSIP program, we, we actually are very similar to a large employer group. We bought a network that provides services through that. It's not a plan itself. Because when we did try to start the PSIP program, none of the California insurance plans wanted to participate. So we had to try a different avenue than our normal model. Um, Healthy Families, I'll give you a quick overview. Our CHIP program is the largest in the nation. We have nearly 900,000 kids. We are bigger than the second, third, and fourth states combined. We're very proud of that, um, to have served over 3 million children, 
The only um, thing um, this year's budget brought us some bad news in that the governor um, kind of did a sideways of what the budget committee said at the last moment with the big three and they are going uh, had passed in the budget to eliminate the Healthy Families Program uh, at the, sometime over the 2013 if they get federal approval and move those children all into the Medi-Cal program. Unfortunately, that will have some impacts that probably will impact your providers because the rates are different between our programs. Um, our AIM program, just a quick overview, provides health coverage to women between two and 300% of the poverty level. They pay 1.5% of their annual income for the program. And we currently serve about 7,200 mothers. Um, this program will continue to exist even after healthcare reform. These are our websites and our 800 numbers. Uh, just want to make sure you had all that information, and that's my email address and my direct line in case anybody has any questions. Um, we're here to serve. We appreciate the opportunity to work with you and collaborate and try to get the uninsured insured. I can't thank you enough for your presentation. Um, I have a feeling that um, this is going to be the top of a pyramid, and hopefully what happens is that your presentation here will go into further information to be disband uh, to be given out to our 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 constituents our doctors so i want to thank you i would assume we have some questions so hopefully you can stay for a few minutes i know sure. Ms. chang dr Dusso, and dr levine we'll go in that order to start with uh, i just have well for instance uh, there is this young woman who just turned 26 so they cannot be on their parents insurance anymore and then went to apply for a commercial uh, program and got turned down for uh, pre-existing conditions. The family is pretty, probably well to do. They, she has some money of her own, but she, has, she don't have regular insurance. Would she qualify for something like this? Yeah, the, with the PSIP program, as long as she meets that she's either a U.S. citizen, U.S. national, or lawfully in the country, she would be eligible. There is no means testing. It's not based on your income. It's basically that you've been turned down by the insurance industry. Basically, in the individual market right now and until January of 2014, they can still redline you out of coverage. They can say you, you may, and one thing about California, which is very different than other states, some states uh, regulate how actuaries define risk. It could be from having had bunions to having um, had a, um, an abnormal pap smear to having cancer or on how they deny you risk. California is kind of like the wild, wild west when it comes to that, but she should be able to apply for one of our programs and qualify. Well, when the, well, Actually, this is my daughter, okay. I, I'm, I'm using that example, I thought, wow, this is unbelievable. And I never thought I would be looking at a situation like that for my kids. And, and it's very strange. Um, the question would be, what kind of category? I, I, I'm, I'm just thinking when he, she was being turned down, was it turned down in what program or? everything or just any program? I think she probably applied for individual coverage. Right. Normally if you're you're in a group, you're not going to get turned down. If you're in a large employer group, just like state employees, you tend to not go through the same that same kind of risk assessment or that actuarial piece. You benefit by being part of a large group. What happens is for sometimes with small employer groups, you get one individual who's had some kind of health issue. I mean, you have people that get arthroscopic surgery for a knee or ankle injury because of a sports injury. That stays with them forever. And right now, until January of 2014, part of the Affordable Care Act is the reform of the market rules. And it will become illegal to uh, deny you for um, health coverage because of your health status. That isn't one of the categories. This is one of the good things of Obamacare, as everybody seems to label it. It becomes illegal. But up until January of 2014, they created PSIP as a bridge for those families. And the other thing is they peg the rates that you're charged at 100% of the individual market rate, not the bumped up rate for somebody with a, a higher condition or with a pre-existing condition. 
So they've made it much more affordable than it's been in the past. As you talked about, in the past, some people just, even if you had a lot of money, you just couldn't get care. Mm -hmm. Or you had to try to buy something like a major medical policy where you don't get basic primary care. Thank you, Dr. Rousseau. You have a question? While the um, California has the largest uh, PCIP program in the nation, it, given the population, it seems like at this point it's still a small number. Uh, what, what is the capacity of the program? What could it uh, serve? What number? I think based on our initial allocation, we were thinking that we could serve up to about 23,000 people based on, the, and this is just on funding. Sure. Um, I think one of the things that when they were talking about the PSIP programs in general nationally, they first came out and said, okay, how many people are out there that potentially have a pre-existing condition or have had one? Mm -hmm. Then they give a big number. And they were saying, okay, these programs should enroll all these things. But they didn't ask a couple questions. First of all, they didn't ask how many of these people have been uninsured for six months. Mm -hmm. You can't drop coverage and come into the federal program. The other part is, even though we talk 100% of the individual market rate, which is cheaper than what they may have been charged in the past, if they could get coverage, 100% of the market rate is not cheap. When we started the program, we asked the federal government if we could use some of the money <coughs> to allow low-income citizens of California to apply for a subsidy so we as a state could help pay for some of the premium. And the response back to us was, you could do it with state dollars. And the legislation that implemented the program here in California basically told us we're not allowed to spend any state dollars Definitely. on this program. So it's kind of a catch-22. I think there are more people out there, but I think the biggest barrier is that six months without coverage. Because a lot of people, if I've got a pre-existing condition that's serious, mm -hmm. I need my treatment, I need my meds, I cannot afford to take a chance and wait six months. We did an analysis, though, and saw that we have had some of our members that used to be on our, our Mr. MIP program, the, the state high pool, drop it and come over to the PSIP program. But I don't think I'd ever tell somebody to drop coverage. That's a, that's a risk. You don't know. Mm -hmm. But there, there have been people that are willing to take that to get better coverage. The other thing with the state program is it has an annual cap and a lifetime cap. So the most you can get in the Mr. Mint program is $75,000 worth of services in a, in a calendar year and a lifetime cap of $750,000. For 98% of the people in our program, it works. But those are that individual who has costly coverage, that really isn't effective for them. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Levine? Yeah, just a question in terms of transition from PSIP to the world of guaranteed issue. Is there a hard stop on PSIP December 31, 2013, or is there some overlap so people can transition in an orderly way to the exchange? I, I think the idea, right now the way it's been put out to us is that the program would end in December 31st, but we are working with the exchange right now in, in discussions because a, a lot of our programs are kind of linked with this idea of no wrong door. Yeah. And there, one of the um, efforts has been this look to say, let's do pre-enrollment. One of the challenges is with the exchange going on right now is they just got their vendors selected to create the system and to create the, the portal where people would come in. They have to meet some dates in early next year, about January. No, I think January is the pre-piece, and then they come out and test in June. The federal government comes out to test that you're ready and functional because interesting thing, which I'm not so sure we totally agree in, that they've got a limited open enrollment period of when you can uh, get into the exchange. And that's gonna be from October until uh, January. And having started three or four programs in my career, when you're trying to enroll people, you should be enrolling continuously for years for the first couple of years, then worry about an open enrollment period. but. You know, there are, you, we've got to follow what's in the Affordable Care Act. So I think that's the challenge. We're looking um, to work on a process where we can do the pre-enrollment process, get our information 
of our PSIP and our Mr. MIP clients over to the exchange um, so they can try to pre-enroll them so that we uh, really walk them across the bridge to exchange coverage if, if, if they qualify for that or subsidize coverage due to the exchange because the other part is if they don't qualify there they couldn't qualify for Medicaid one of the things because these high risk pools they're not based on income right now so we don't have income information on a lot of them it's just based on being denied so in, in terms of healthy families I guess the door is closed on that program uh, not totally I mean we are in while they changed the law and we're not the decision makers those are at the legislature and the governor's office they passed the law that says it should transition no sooner than beginning in January and in four or five groups contingent on CMS approval. We are in discussions with CMS because as part of the bill there was a lot of concern at the legislature that um, the Medi-Cal program with its 7.5 million people that are currently served in it um, is busting at the seams and, and they don't have enough providers to see, serve their current population. They also currently have the move to move the aged and disabled into Medi-Cal managed care. They're supposed to be moving the, the dual eligibles or the medi medis as they call them over the next piece. They tried to move the adult day health care folks out of that or they tried to eliminate that program and that kind of failed. The courts have stepped in. One of the things that DMHC has been required, the Department of Managed Health Care, is they're supposed to do a network adequacy study of report back to the legislature in October and supposedly these things are going to be evaluated before any children are moved. Um, I think that's going to be a real key because there's a lot of concern not only on the healthcare side because you can say a doctor is a medical provider but most docs have a limit on what patients they are accepting in their practice and just because you're certified doesn't mean you're actually taking new patients. So I think that's a challenge, and on the dental side, it's even more sparse. Mm. So there's a, there's a lot of concern. I mean, you had 70 advocacy groups and, and both budget committees that were against this proposal, and it was only when the big three got together that this got passed, which unfortunately, we don't make those decisions, but we, we want to keep taking care of our kids as well as we can as we bring that bridge across to the Medi-Cal program if and when the federal government approves that. Thanks very much. Sure. Thank you. Let me just ask you a question so I understand clearly. Different. Right. If it's part of the PSIP network, your out-of-pocket costs are less. Exactly. But there's the option that the yes, client you has. Yes, can, you can, you can, has, right. in, in the benefit package, you can select to go out of network and you pay a little bit more of the cost related to that. Okay. So, Dr. Diego, does that answer your question? Any other questions? Well, I want to thank you very much for this informative presentation. Really, it's um, good luck. Our, our pleasure. We thank appreciate you. the opportunity. Thank, thank you. you. Very nice. So we're going to move on to the uh, agenda item number seven and ask uh, Mr. Wood to please come forward and uh, do an update on the strategic plan objectives and the plan objectives. Let me ask you a question. In the packet that we have here, I understand under Section 18 is the um, strategic plan, but that's not in this book, correct? Uh, the, if you look on uh, page 91 of your packet is my report there, and that takes you step by step through the objectives and the activities. 91 is what um, we received. Under uh, the this way. Education and Wellness Committee. Just hand it. Okay, I just want to make sure members are in the same place right. as you are while we go forward. 91 is a blank. Okay. No, this handout came um, a couple days ago. No. <laughs> item, agenda item 7. Are there extra copies, Mr. Einer, in the back? Could you make sure um, members have them, please? Some press. Well, you can bring them around. So anyone that doesn't have it, could you just let Mr. Einer know and he will make sure you have it? <clears throat> I have one of this, correct? But the question I had was, is that in this notebook is not the, um, in this board packet is not the, um, it went out of my, the strategic plan that's page nine, right, correct? I, I, I believe if I understand what you're asking, yes. Okay. So, thank you. I didn't want people to be looking for the strategic plan in this notebook if it's not here. 
and it's not here, so people shouldn't look. That's all. Okay. Thanks. So, your presentation, sir. Uh, good morning, committee members. I'm Dan Wood, the Public Affairs Officer. Uh, I'm here to update you on the strategic plan of the Public Affairs Office, which, as I mentioned, is agenda item number seven, page 91 in your packet. Now, there are objectives 3.1 and 3 uh, through 3.9. I'll begin with objective 3.1, which is to improve and expand the professional educational outreach to students and new graduates about the laws and regulations that govern medical practice. There are six activities to this objective, and I'll begin the review uh, with the determination to improve uh, the public website of the board. And this is the first activity. Over the past six months, I have met with our web users committee, which overviews the entire public website and what it contains. And we set forth a plan of action that will redesign and launch a new public website by the end of 2012. To speed this effort along, we have also created the web design committee, which was formed strictly to deal with the look, feel, and functionality of the new set while the Web Users Committee deals with the content. The timeline for the development of the site is included in your agenda. It takes you up to the first week of November, at which time the first week of November we will actually begin group testing of the new site to determine the ease of navigation of the site and identify areas of concern or needs for revision of the site. The second activity of objective 3.1 is to utilize the website and the newsletter to inform licensees of any changes in the laws, regulations, patterns, practice patterns, and issues of public health. Now, the Public Affairs Office is seeking cooperative uh, opportunities with other agencies, boards, and associations to identify issues that impact health care and convey that information about these issues through email blasts, alerts on the board website, and articles published in the newsletter. Articles written by staff of these groups on these relevant issues are sought by the Public Affairs Office, and the focus of such articles is to be on the education of physicians and health care providers. The third activity is to work with state, county, and federal agencies to inform licensees of the changes in the laws and events impacting their practices. Now, when these changes occur, an alert can be placed on the board website, and in some cases, even an email blast sent out informing them of the changes or the event. An example of this is when the FDA issued an alert just earlier this month on cartridge-jet pre-filled cartridges. The cartridges were overfilled with medicine to the point that a patient could actually receive double the dose of medicine that was expected. This could be a severe health issue. An alert was placed on the board website and an email blast was sent out to warn physicians of this danger. The fourth activity is to educate physicians about complying with the law and the Guide to Laws Governing the Practice of Medicine booklet is now being updated. This will be the seventh edition of the book and it is pending final review which will take place in the first week of August and then it will be posted online and sent to print. The fifth activity is the reestablishment of the teams of two and a speakers bureau. The Public Affairs Office is in the process of implementing a team of two on a local basis them being around Northern California, the Sacramento and San Francisco area. And we are asking groups that are seeking speakers uh, from the teams of two to give us six months advance notice so that we may arrange a schedule with a board member and a staff member and prepare the necessary materials for the event. Our target for this is spring of 2013. And the last objective of our last activity of objective 3.1 is to conduct outreach to various organizations, hospitals, and groups, colleges, and universities around the Sacramento. And hospitals are also notified of the availability of speakers. And in fact, in May of this year, I spoke to a, a health care class at Sacramento State University concerning the operations of the Medical Board of California and its mission to protect the public. Such outreach is continuing to go on, and we make those arrangements as they come into our office. 
Now, objective 3.2 is to improve public education by expanding current outreach efforts and initiating more outreach programs to educate the public on the board's programs, the rights of patients, and how to file complaints. Activity one here again is to review the board website for improvements. And as I said, by the end of 2012, the Public Affairs Office will have the new website ready to launch. And when it's launching, all board publications will be available for download uh, from the website. Uh, this will save us a considerable amount of expense, uh, although printed issues will still remain available. Activity two is to identify consumer education groups and publications that will ass assist in the distribution of board materials. The Public Affairs Office has reached agreements for distribution of such board materials with the Board of Pharmacy, the EDD, the California Medical Association, the California Department of Public Health, the Major Risk Medical Insurance Board, and each of these groups has added or will be adding a link to the Medical Board website on their own website and reprinting articles in, from our newsletter in their own publications. Activity three is to schedule meetings with editorial boards once a year. Now, such meetings are scheduled to begin in November, but using available resources such as phone conferencing and possibly video conferencing. Present travel restrictions by the state have limited the face-to-face -face meetings to local media outlets in the Sacramento and Northern California region. Activity four is the updating of brochures to reflect the current practice environment. All board publications are being reviewed and updates made as necessary. Updated brochures are made available immediately upon approval for download on the board website. And that is again, as I say, pending final approval uh, from the executive director. Beyond that, then it goes to print. Activity five is to work with other state agencies to provide board materials to consumers. The activity is currently being achieved as the Department of Consumer Affairs and the Public Affairs Office of the board have developed a, an excellent working relationship and we will actually be using DCA video production facilities to, for the production of public service announcement or public service announcements and a campaign. That campaign is designed to promote public participation in events of the board and awareness of the medical board and its programs. Activity six is the development of social media outreach. This is a very important issue as it has become a major source of communication for people worldwide. Social media sites such as Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn are going to be utilized to convey information to the public about board activities, important notices, alerts, public service announcements, and even our newsletter. Social media will play an important role in achieving the mission of protecting the public. This is because social media is literally the fastest way to communicate with specific audiences. The social media outreach campaign will begin in mid-August of this year. And the seventh activity to uh, the board of, uh, is to add board information to the California Healthcare Benefit Exchange, or CHBE. That activity is scheduled for fall of 2013 and will take place following discussions between this board and the executive director of the CHBE which is expected to begin in fall. Objective 3.3 is to identify more effective efforts to promote expert reviewer program and recruit qualified patient or physicians. The newsletter and the website are being utilized to achieve this objective. And with the launch of the social media campaign and the Teams of Two Speakers program, this effort will be expanded with a focus on recruiting and educating physicians about the program and how to be involved. Objective 3.4 is to establish a more proactive approach to communicating with the media and the public, as well as educating both about disciplinary cases and investigations, including those to be done in concert with other agencies. Activity one of objective 3.4 is to build relationships with major media so that information on all the disciplinary cases is provided to the appropriate outlets. Now, the Public Affairs Office uses every opportunity to educate media representatives on how to use the board website, how to research information on physicians. In fact, 
Press kits have already been uh, prepared, and we have those for distribution. We have been using those at board, web, uh, board meetings for, uh, since January, and we will continue to do that. Uh, in fact, the Public Affairs Office is going to have a much more visible uh, media center presence on the new public website, and the Public Affairs Office will also continue to uh, generate story ideas for journalists and producers and provide media outlets with video for use in news stories or broadcasts on the web. Activity two is to work with the DCA to establish a joint news release procedure. This is occurring at present as once news releases are distributed, they are sent to the DCA and the DCA is also notified of any on-camera or recorded interviews. The Public Affairs Office also provides what is called a look ahead to DCA, informing them of any actions or anticipated events that would generate publicity either positive or negative. Activity three is, as we said, the creation of press kits. We have done this so far, but what you're looking for in the future is the creation of an electronic press kit, which can be distributed online, via CD-ROM, uh, or literally by email, so we would be able to connect with media outlets literally worldwide. Objective 3.5 is to expand the newsletter to better inform physicians and students and the public. And activity one is to evaluate how the current newsletter is used by readers. The fall 2012 edition. Mr. Wood, could I just ask you to pardon. just soften? It, it, it's getting very loud. Oh, okay, sorry. Thank you. Activity one is to evaluate how the current newsletter is used by readers and the fall 2012 edition of the newsletter will include an extensive survey that can be taken online and electronically tabulated, allowing the Public Affairs Office to have the metrics with which to determine what sections of the newsletter are of most interest to readers and how to best expand to meet the expectations of our readers. Once this information is gathered and analyzed, changes will be proposed to better reflect the needs of readers of the newsletter. Activity two is to allow subscribers to choose to receive the newsletter by email or on social media. Presently, the newsletter is sent by email to subscribers and blasted out to licensees. When the social media campaign launches, an option to receive the newsletter on social media will be made as well. Activity three is to establish a feedback mechanism for content of the newsletter to determine who is reading it and for what material. In each edition of the newsletter, we ask readers to provide feedback by emailing us, and they do just that. And such e feedback is tracked and consideration made to all suggestions. When the new board website goes live in late December, a direct link to the editor will be provided to make it actually easier to provide this feedback. Activity four is to promote readership of the newsletter and each issue or each edition promotes articles that are coming up in the next edition. Also by creating reciprocal agreements with other boards, agencies and association, readership is expected to flourish as these groups provide links to the board's newsletter and the board website. In addition, these groups are guaranteed to publish articles from the Public Affairs Office in their own newsletters and publications, thus expanding our readership once again. Activity five is to reach out to other agencies and foundations to contribute articles to the newsletter, and we began this activity in early spring of this year, and the continuation of that effort continues uh, as it existed prior to my arrival here at the Medical Board. Uh, we have published articles from the Federation of State Medical Boards, the California Department of Public Health, the Centers for Disease Control, and many others, and this has proved to be a very successful exchange of articles and ideas. We've also created video and audio links which are in the newsletter for even more information. Activity six is to incorporate more information on board activities in the newsletter. <coughs> and each edition publicizes upcoming board activities and covers ones that have already occurred 
in the last edition of the, uh, since the last edition of the newsletter. Those efforts will continue to grow with the advent of the social media program, which we will use to disseminate information about events uh, as, as they occur. Activity seven is to encourage professional associations to include links to the newsletter on their website. As each association is contacted and we build a relationship with them, this request for a link to the newsletter and the board site becomes a priority for the Public Affairs Office. I basically ask each agency that wants us to convey their information to return the favor, and they do so. I'm happy to report that the efforts to achieve this activity have been successful and many times the links are already in place. Objective 3.9 is to conduct outreach to ethnic and other language publications and activity one is to identify groups to be targeted. Now California, as we know, is an extremely diverse state and there's media to represent e nearly every non-English speaking language uh, spoken in the state or where, in, uh, where English is a second language. Uh, this is list of uh, media opportunities is being compiled, expected to be completed in the winter of 2012. Activity two, to identify those media outlets for non-English speaking groups and reach out to them. And then we are running that in concurrent with activity one as the objective of, of objective 3.1. And as these outlets are identified, the Public Affairs Office will provide full board materials to them in the language that represents their audience. The full board will be updated on this plan in the January board meeting. Activity three is to identify those staff members that may be able to communicate with these groups through spoken language or cultural sensitivity. At the January 2013 board meeting, the Public Affairs Office will present a plan to address these groups and expand the board's communication efforts. The Public Affairs Office will continue to update the committee on the progress of this activity. Lastly, uh, activity four of objective 3.9 is to reach out to non-English speaking audiences yeah. in concert with outreach efforts to English language and general audience. This activity will also incorporate the Teams of Two speakers program, giving the board a greater opportunity to reach to more people and explain exactly what and how the medical board serves the healthcare consumers each and every day. Now, this concludes my report on the strategic plan for the Public Affairs Office. <coughs> Moving on, I'd like to update the committee on activities of the oh, Public Affairs Office. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> this is, you know, you read very well, but no, 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 you get questions in, in no, 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 no. So, thank you for the update on your strategic plan. But let's start, because there are some issues with, okay. the, with this. and. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. I decide and you'll come around the Sure, room. Madam Chair, thank you. Um, and thank you for the uh, uh, report. And I gather by your voice you must have been in broadcasting or something. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Very trained <laughs> voice. Um, a couple of things just to let you know, because I brought this up before, um, I actually teach healthcare administration. I had my students as an assignment in, in two semesters um, go through our website as consumers. And um, they didn't have high marks at all. Um, they thought it was, it was very physician-oriented and that it was very difficult for a consumer um, to find out where to go to um, get the information they need, that it's just it's not an intuitive website. And I'm an elected official. Many governmental um, websites are not intuitive. So I would hope when you're doing your focus groups that you actually get real live consumers and not um, government staff to you know to determine how we can best make this because it's a twofold website it's, it's obviously for the licensee uh, potential licensee but also for the consumer and the other big issue is in the Vietnamese community in particular in Orange County um, they've expressed to me that um, it's very difficult if not impossible to find out in their own language how to file a complaint um, and that there's some concerns in the community that um, the community is not aware how to do that. Um, and I'm wondering if instead of segmenting on the website, as I remember it, um, that you actually have a, you have a, a tab, <coughs> excuse me, for each particular major language. So they could just click on that and in that tab they would find the information they would need as a consumer, including whatever publications are in their language. 
um, because otherwise they have to have some knowledge of how to navigate the system to get in to find their own language um, and all the materials that go with that. So um, that, that's just a, a suggestion. The other thing is um, if we can, and I know you mentioned about um, webcasting, and one of the things we do in the city of Long Beach is we have a system called Legistar. And Legistar is excellent because it not only posts online our agenda, um, it does a couple of things. It allows the public to leave comments about the agenda because if they can't be at a meeting, that way they can post and then that's shared. Obviously, it's a public record. The other thing is that it links with the actual broadcast of that meeting so that if you wanted to go back and see what I said on a particular issue on a particular council meeting, you can click on it and it will go right to the video for that meeting. It will show you what was discussed and it links it then to the paper document. And it's very helpful um, because it allows the public to, to be involved in a way that they can't normally if they don't come to the meeting and they don't want to wade through paper documents. Um, and it's, it's readily available. It's called Legistar. Um, and it would be great if our board could lead the way on the state level of making that um, accessible to the consumer in every way possible. As someone who uses social media, not only with Facebook and the blog and Twitter, I have real concerns about um, putting the medical board into the social media realm because my concern is it will become a discussion group on doctors. People will start posting doctors' names and there will be discussions in there. While we think it's a way to communicate information, and I think there might be a way, the way that those social media work, um, you would have to have somebody on there all the time monitoring it and deciding whether or not to delete a comment. And as we know that that's very, in a governmental realm, there's First Amendment issues about censoring communication. But we run the risk in the social media about people start discussing doctors. One of the things that we've already determined is that uh, social media would be a one-way street strictly for disseminating information uh, because you can set it up so that there are not comments uh, available because exactly what you're talking about. And so it, it, we use it as just another avenue to disseminate the information, but we're not looking to create a, an open discussion. So let me take the President's prerogative and suggest that what I'm hearing from Ms. Shipsky is that social media might not be at a point where we are totally fully integrating it into a system come August of this year and that there might be some need for you to review policies and procedures with this committee as we go forward with use of social media and its appropriate use and um, what else did you suggest you said uh, use and uh, design how's that does that cover right 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 and, and I think you know obviously and I, I've heard this um, you know, from my point, uh, point of body, that they're very concerned about that, you know, we make certain that our, the way that we are communicating, that we really ramp up the consumer uh, outreach and that we ramp up the information and accessibility. And I think people right now are very comfortable about going to a website and finding information, mm -hmm. but also having a way to perhaps leave comments that can come, come to the board, but not necessarily then open it up um, for a dialogue, a public no. dialogue about specific doctors uh, or that nature. So that, that would be my, my concern, that we want to disseminate the information, encourage feedback, but we, we really want to protect uh, the licensees from, you know, a public um, kind of exactly. fashion that, that often so happens you need more to... than not, not on those social medias, and that would include no. YouTube. And, because you know on YouTube you can leave comments. Um, so, and I don't know how you, I, I know you can uh, on Facebook, limit, but Twitter is the same thing. You can rehash and resend, and then what you've got then is a going dialogue where someone can insert um, some very harmful information um, on our licenses. So I would just say we... Okay, let's continue the conversation. Dr. Bean? Just a couple comments. The first is that um, there are multiple, in terms of reaching the provider community, mm -hmm. specialty societies, American Congress of Obstetrics and Gynecology, American Academy of Pediatrics, it isn't just the county medical societies and CMA. Um, they all have websites and they are often visited by their 
by the licensees who in many ways identify closely with their specialty society. Mm -hmm. So those are sources. Also CAP G, who I know has been very eager in to help and promote the medical board's website. Um, and my, my second set of comments has to do with in a number of places you talk about identifying staff members and board members um, to translate materials into other languages. And I think we need to be very careful that we've got certified um, people who are skilled and trained in the translation of materials rather than grabbing someone who happens to be fluent in, in, in a language. Well, absolutely. We contract with outside uh, groups to, to be able to do that. But in reference to double checking and, and to make sure that it is a, a readable document because oftentimes translations are subject to interpretation. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's a check and balance of the system. I'm going to suggest that, that non-English speaking media sources have translators on staff so that if you take a look at La Opinion, for example, I can't believe that that there isn't someone that if you hand them a camera ready, here's an article about making sure you don't have doctors performing surgeries in the garage, they're going to be able to translate and put it into the... So I think it's more of an issue, what I'm hearing from Dr. Levine, is making those connections with either specialty groups or with organizations. And go down the regular route. We don't need the 50,000 foot uh, visual. What we need is to start from the ground up and make sure that our, our sources are being... Are, are, we're starting at the bottom, we're not starting at the top, what we'd like to see at the end. We want to make sure that the foundation is laid appropriately. Is that correct, Dr. Levine? Yeah, I'm, I'm reacting to the language that says staff members who have the ability to speak other languages or translate materials are being identified. And it, do, it isn't clear what they're being identified for. Um, just to be certain that we actually have professionals doing the work. Okay. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Well, uh, you know, I, I was just about to volunteer my service. Now <laughs> I have to think twice. Well, just last couple of weeks, I'm, I'm, I've been off the city council for almost eight years to get on this board. But the city clerk just sent me a uh, election piece of paper and for me just to review it, to edit, and to review it, actually. I look at that. It was done professionally, but the whole thing made no sense whatsoever. Now, I end up taking it back and had someone translated and checked it. I understand the election very well, so I send it back to them and say, check it again, but this is a better version than what you have. So having somebody who understands the process to review it, it's, it's, a, it's a good place. And uh, it's just like, you know, I'm willing to look at what you did for with the Chinese version of your thing. And maybe somebody can do it the same thing as the Vietnamese version. I think Jerry has somebody who actually looked at it and said it doesn't make sense, it's difficult. So that part I thought was important. And uh, I, I still will volunteer some of my service if you really need it. Um, but I, I'm glad you had done, had gave us a very comprehensive, comprehensive report. Thank you. Thank for you. The hard work. Thank you. Dr. Chan? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, let me make a couple of comments. Uh, the medical board is seen by the public and by the providers that we are uh, regulators of medicine in the state. <clears throat> and use the social media as a source to the rest of the public is too social. It's too social. I think we are going to need to use the word education. I think that we need to educate who? The providers, starting work in the medical schools, internship, residents, fellows. Why? Because these doctors, when they start private practice, they don't know the rules of the game. And they start playing, and they make mistakes, and they only learn about the medical board when they make the mistakes. That is the moment, that is the place where we need to educate who? The providers. And the public 
we're going to need to find some promotion marketing experts, I am not the expert, who is going to educate these people, the rest of the public. Now, in different languages, of course, but we're going to also need to have the experts who they are going to do that. And finally, we need to make this as an education. It cannot be social media. Especially, everybody, everybody is going to start finding something wrong with us. They're going to start criticizing, like in the past. Why we have you here today? Because in the last two, three years, we were getting all these nasty articles mm -hmm. in LA Times here, here and there. And we finally, with the leadership of, of uh, Barbara, you know, we, we say we need to find somebody who is going to be what? Ahead of these particular people. And that's what we are doing today. But let's go do very professionally. And no entering that social media, uh, you know, that I don't think is the right thing to do. Thank you, Dr. Karen. I'm going to start this in and come back this way. Dr. Diego, do you have something to say, suggest? Um, just like Dr. Carrillo me mentioned about um, making sure that um, what we do in the social media, I, I just don't think that um, physicians, the medical board, really is, I, I, well, I don't think the social media is ready for a regulatory body at this point. And the other thing is, you know, in terms of like the newsletter, um, it, that is definitely the place where we want to somehow attract the uh, physicians to learn about, like what he said, you know, learn about how not to come before us as a, as a regulatory body. So it's, um, even when I read it, it's kind of very dry. I love reading Barbara's comments. Um, you know, in the newsletter, but we really want to make it more um, educational for our physicians. Well, I don't know if this is philosophically problematic, but I know in our professional society website, there is a section for physicians where you have your little password, and, and so there are things that are kind of internal that perhaps could be misinterpreted by the general public, and then there is the general website. So I don't know if that's considered lack of transparency, but I do think that's something to consider. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is when you do a survey about how you're doing online, I'm concerned that it's already biased by the people that are already comfortable online. So I think there might be some older physicians who are still missing the written form, and I just want to make sure that we know has the transition to the online um, been well received, uh, and how can you know how can we measure that? And then I just remember from my <coughs> exam before the Senate rules or whatever about reaching the underserved community. How will we know that we're achieving that goal? So, mm -hmm. some thoughts. Thank you, Dr. Dussel. I would just say that uh, this is uh, very good and very comprehensive. And I like the uh, your outreach approach to various uh, groups Thank you. and so forth. Uh, unless I missed something, yesterday at, uh, in our executive committee, we, <clears throat> we talked about uh, being uh, more proactive uh, when there's uh, negative media that relates to the board. And, and I kind of read through this, but I don't... I didn't see a section in there or an intent to be more proactive uh, when, when we have such issues with the board and its activities. And so I would encourage us to think about that. How might we be more proactive in, in responding? Part of the uh, problem with journalists, myself being one for <laughs> nearly 30 years, okay. is that you can't control the journalist and what they see or what they interpret. Uh, obviously some of them have a particular bias or just they see to create uh, or seek to create uh, fear where there is none just for the sake of generating audience interest. Yep. Uh, unfortunately there's not much you can do about those kind of journalists. They exist, they always have, and sadly to say they will continue to be out there. 
Uh, what we try to do, though, is explain and talk with them, and then again, this is part of the meeting with editorial boards and producers, to get them to understand exactly what the board does, what our responsibilities are, mm -hmm. and the fact that we are bound by the same rules of due process as everybody else. Okay. Uh, this is one of the biggest problems that uh, I have encountered in my time here at the board is every, not every, but a, a large majority of the journalists saying, well, why wasn't this done months ago? Or when you first heard about this, why didn't you do that? And I have to explain to them that due process, a person is innocent until proven guilty. And I've tried many, many times with some journalists to explain that step by step, and they still don't get it. Uh, but that is, that is the way they tend to think, and in the case of the journalists that like to sensationalize and make a mountain out of nothing, uh, that's what they're going to do. Uh, and they seem to be the ones that everybody looks at and says so. Uh, I have actually had journalists call me after seeing a report on another station or reading an article in the paper and say, what about this? And then I tell them what the situation really is, and they go, oh, okay, that figures. And basically what they're saying is they understand because they know the journalist that wrote or publicized the article in the first place uh, has their own bias or agenda. And uh, so they, they you, you tend to focus in on the ones that are good journalists and work with them the most because they're the ones that will get the accurate information out. The ones that are the sensationalists, they take a back seat. Yeah. So thank you, Dr. So uh, Let me suggest that um, with the objective 3.1, your first um, your first discussion point, this web design and web users and web committee that's meeting constantly. Um, I would echo that I don't know who's on that committee, but I assume there aren't any board members, um, which is your prerogative. By the same token, I would hope that there are some consumers that are on there, as well as licensees, so that you get a feedback and an idea of how the web is working for people that are using it, not just from us at the staff of the medical board. That's number one. Number two, on the um, consumer education uh, groups on objective 3.2 and number two, the second activity directs the public information officer to identify consumer education groups. Industry, that's not real hard. I mean, I'd like to know, I'd like to have a progress report of which consumer groups are being outreached to, which media sources are being outreached to, which ethnic community organizations and media sources are being outreached to because um, I want to I want to know that this is happening. We've been this is before your time. This predates your being here. You should know, but the request has been made, and the request continues to be made, and the request continues to show up. And I don't feel like we are doing as broad as, as deep a job as we need to be doing. So talking about it, is, I'm getting tired of talking about it. So you're getting the brunt of this because you're here now, but it's been going on, so don't take this personally. Oh, it's basically what I'm saying. Um, the, the idea that social media, I, can, I, I can't tell you how abhorrent it is to me. And the idea that this is going to be implemented in August of 2012 without any discussion, with public discussion, with resources, be it the professional entities, the CMA, the M AMA, the professional societies, what are you doing about social media? How are you regulating it? How are you implementing it? When can it be used? We're, it's just not ready for prime time. And I have to tell you honestly that it's my opinion that until we have our basics, our foundation in place strong and doing an excellent job, we can't be detract, distracted from our core mission and our core responsibility. And that is to license and discipline the license of doctors. It's to educate them as well as educate the consumers what it is that we do for you here and how we can interface with you and do a better job. And I'm going to tell you honestly, you're going to have to shelve it, and, and in my opinion, but we will, I don't know how it's going to get to that point, but we'll have to discuss it because um, my frustration is even at the Federation of State Medical Boards, it's a discussion under topic. And I don't know what they've come up with. I, I don't think we can be the jet setter here. It, we could be the jet setter if we had 
everybody taken care of if everything we needed to do was done and we had all the money in the world and staff to do it, but we don't. So when we talk about what it is that our function, our core mission of this medical board is, it's not to have instantaneous news and instantaneous opportunities for, for information that we don't know where it's going. So I would like to have more of a um, understanding from your office as to what other um, entities in a regulatory manner, in a physician manner, in a consumer manner, what are they doing with the use of social media and what are the guidelines and restrictions that they've instituted because we haven't heard about any of that. No. Okay, so wait, wait, I'm not finished. Sorry. You asked a question. Sorry. Oh, I did, no, no, I'm, I'm directing my questions to the, to the, to our information officer. Um, when you say that on our website that we um, have the opportunity now for people to click in and, and send questions to you directly, I assume that there are people that are um, collecting that data and that information. I would be real curious as to how many responses do you get to the, uh, on the, on the, to the web and what are the kinds of things that people are concerned with and maybe that might also generate some further discussion of where we go. Maybe it is social media. I don't know. Maybe they want instantaneous information. But I'd like to know some of those comments and how many of our readers are, in fact, how, how interactive is this process? Um, the outreach to ethnic and um, other language publications has to be done in a, a localized area, almost like compartments. So if we're in, if our meetings are in Los Angeles, it's a huge media resource, huge uh, ethnic diversity, huge numbers. Take the time and the opportunity to, to do that then there. So you don't have to worry about travel restrictions, the same as here, we're in Sacramento or when we're in Long Beach, wherever we're meeting, there are local, there's local media, and that's what we need to reach out to more. We need to not worry about the Wall Street Journals, the New York Times, the LA Times, the world, but to the local newspaper who everybody is reading. Without doubt, I think that that's where we have to take a look, and, and I would like to see a plan. So those are my, my issues with the report. It's very full, it's very full, and I thank you for making a very full report but we also need time to digest what you've written and uh, on a go forward basis. Now I'm going to ask for more, a couple more comments from the people here, the board, uh, the committee, sorry, and then I'm going to ask for public comment because I think we have members of the public here and if you have anything that you'd like to add or, or be heard at on this item of communication and how do we get our message out both to the consumers as well as our licensees, I would be, I, I would hope that this would be an opportunity for people to speak. So please fill out a, a, a slip. Um, and give it to Kevin. Kevin, would you raise your hand, Mr. Shunky, please? But um, Ms. Uh, Chang, you had additional comments, and Dr. Carrion, and then I think we'll hear from the public, okay? Yeah, well, the, uh, can you hear me? Oh, yeah. The social media issue was discussed at the Federation level, and it's advised not to do it. I, I, I didn't think I influenced you before. But it is it is advised not to do it by actually by our lawyer. Um, but the uh, issue on the uh, outreach to the ethnic group, I thought that was a very important issue. <coughs> Since I got on the board, we had this uh, committee, and we did very actually. I I thought we didn't do enough. So therefore. Um, I am very happy you're doing it, and um, since I'm going to be off the board, if I only concentrate on one thing, I will be happy to volunteer on this one. Great. That's good. That's good. good. Maybe you also read the publications and see if they're showing up. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Carry on. Uh, Mr. Wood, let me give you a suggestion. Uh, basically, what we try to do here is, is a promotion of the medical board. I use that because marketing is for services or products, okay? Now, the promotion is going to need to be scientific promotion. How? You're going to need to find what, what the experts call a needs analysis. Needs analysis means that what they need the providers, what they need the public how you are going to do it. You are going to do what they call also focus groups. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, try to put together five or 10 doctors, five or 10 public people, and say, what do you need from the medical board? That is what it, when you are going to have a conclusion 
how we are going to do it. That is how it's done today, scientifically. Okay, thank you. Um, do I have any members of the public that would like to address? Mr. Cuny, why don't you come forward? And you'll give me a slip in a few minutes, okay? As a representative of the citizen organization, I want to acknowledge and congratulate the board for taking leadership on trying to get information to the public more. It's good work and needs to be continued. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, so now we're going to move on to number eight. Mr. Wood. Uh, this is a consideration, discussion consideration, the mission and goals for the new education and wellness committee. And you're going to lead us in a discussion, please. Agenda item eight for the committee is the consideration and adoption of a mission statement and goals for the future. And with the historic changes occurring in the form of the Patients' Rights and Affordable Care Act, it's more important than ever for physicians to continue to be educated on these issues that affect their practice and their patients. Now, physicians obviously can expect patients to come to them seeking unbiased answers on the changes to health care. And as this committee moves forward, it will need a mission statement. Members of the committee may wish to consider as a mission statement the following. To further the board's mission of protecting health care consumers, the mission of the Education and Wellness Committee is to seek out and promote educational opportunities for licensees and consumers that enhances the practice of medicine, the well-being of healthcare consumers, and aids in the development of a sound balance of personal and professional lives so that physicians can be healthy of mind and body and offer quality health care. Now, should the committee decide to adopt this mission statement or a variation of it, the committee may also wish to adopt <coughs> the following goals for the future. The committee may wish to promote cross-educational opportunities that promote the reduction of stress and contribute to a sound balance of personal and professional <laughs> lives. And once these programs are identified, articles describing the programs and their benefits can be published in the board's newsletter uh, and on the board website and through email. The committee may also wish to research how to educate consumers on the role that they play in being proactive in their own health care and how best to communicate with physicians. Again, this information can be printed in article form in the newsletter. In addition, such information can be incorporated into public service campaign. The committee may also wish to identify the changes in health care reform and what it has and the effect that it has on medical practice and healthcare consumers and educate physicians on the best methods for implementing those changes. The committee may also wish to identify areas of education that promote healthy environments and lifestyles for physicians and patients. Examples of these programs are the Kaiser Permanente's Thrive, the Well Life programs like Cartelet Health, and the Healthy Lifestyle programs available from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Staff further recommends that the committee review and possibly revise the proposed mission statement. <clears throat> Staff recommends that the committee review and possibly revise the goals of the committee. Staff recommends the committee direct staff to develop ways to implement the goals of the committee. Staff recommends the committee direct staff to analyze and report on the healthy lifestyle training sites that are available online. And staff recommends the committee direct staff to write articles on the best way to communicate with your physician for the creation of a brochure and publication in the newsletter, as well as being made available online at the board's website. This concludes my report for agenda item eight. Does the committee have any questions? No, but we're going to have a discussion <laughs> since it's supposed to be a discussion. Um, so what I'd like to hear from the members with reviewing this mission statement, does this seem to um, fill the void of what was, of the unknown of what the combining of the two committees left us with? 
Does that start, let's start with the mission statement. Is that okay with you? Right. Correct. So looking at the mission statement and not looking to wordsmith, okay, I'm not looking to wordsmith, but the um, opportunity to reformat what it is and what the purpose of this committee is, as stated, how do you feel about that? Or what is your input? Or what are your comments? Or is this what you want to go with? Uh, Barbara? Yes, Dr. Terriam. Thank you. I think that we are missing a word here that is extremely important. We jump from education to wellness. How about prevention? I think it should be education, prevention, and wellness. Okay? We are jumping something extremely important that if you uh, review the healthcare reform, they make emphasis in prevention. I think it's, it's the same here. It should be education, prevention, and wellness. <coughs> okay. Um, any other comments? Uh, Ms. Shipsky, please. The same thing, I think it is a little confusing. I know you've merged education wellness, but I think the focus... You're, you please could you use the microphone so that they can hear you? Yeah, thank you. I, I think it's a little confusing. I know we've merged education wellness, but I think the focus on wellness has been solely on physicians. And so what I think needs to be clear, are we then expanding this committee to include the wellness of consumers? Because that, is, that was never the focus of the wellness committee whatsoever. It was totally focused on physician wellness and the issues about that. Sure. So um, either we need to expand and say we're doing that, or I, I think it begs the question about why the two, commit, why the two are together. I, I, I know what you're saying, and I think the issue of education and wellness do go hand in hand, as well as prevention. The consumer is where we get into the, into the gray area. So the idea of the ability to transfer and translate educating consumers what they can and can't do, or should or should about be wellness? Uh, no, about health. No, about doctors. About health care. No. Uh, well, and again, then I have great difficulty about okay, the two so being nailed yeah, because okay. it's just they they have different really they have missions. different missions. Okay, so I understand that. Yeah. Um, Dr. Levine, no, I, I actually uh, my comment was the same. I think I think it is beyond our scope to be getting involved in public. Um, public. Sorry. Go ahead. In Sorry. taking on the issue of con uh, in, in the, the responsibility for educating consumers about their own health status, health improvement, there are an awful lot of entities that have responsibility and accountability for that. Um, I think it's beyond our scope. I think, to me, the link was educate, or the, the, the link, the bridge in my head was educating consumers about the function of the board, the role and responsibility of the board, mm -hmm. and at the same time ensuring that we were, as a, as a medical board, doing what we could to ensure the health and wellness and, if you will, preventive opportunities for prevention of stress-related illness within the provider community. Right, that's right. My concern is you don't get the focus attention on the wellness component like we were going down that track versus pulling this whole thing in about educating consumers about the function of the board and you know it, it just this I, I, I'm concerned that if you know committee can only do so much so much and some something's going to suffer and I would really hate to see the wellness part suffer because we've got so much work to do on the educational component for consumers. So that's just uh, a concern. Maybe what we should do is hear from um, staff as to the previous incarnation of why we combined or looked to combine both committees and what the rationale. I can see taking the word health, uh, the words, you know, being of well being of healthcare consumers out of the mission statement period that that should come out regardless. But maybe is what I'm hearing you would like 
an understanding if we're going to have a combined committee and what the combined committee should achieve or expect to achieve versus two separate committees. So, Mr. Wood, do you want to do that? Ms. Whitney, do you want to do that? Ms. Kirchmeyer, does someone want to do it? Because I sure can't. I'll be glad to. Okay. How about if the Somebody whole doing, team comes please. up and, and explains to us what we're doing and why? Uh, why health care? Oh, excuse me. As, as part of your strategic plan, uh, we reviewed all of the committees. And in your discussion of the continuation of certain committees, you consolidated some of them. And in this case, you chose to consolidate the education with wellness committee because they both had to do with the concept of education, education of maybe uh, two different groups, not separate and distinct, but uh, wellness, the education of physicians, the education, education of physicians and consumers. So that is why your discussion was to combine the two. It doesn't mean that in this committee you realize that maybe you need to separate to some degree and make a wellness task force within your committee or that you maybe made um, a hasty decision and you would like to reconsider that possibility of having two committees. That's perfectly all right. That's up to you. There, there's no restriction here on what you do. It was just something that you had made in working through your strategic plan. So if you would like to discuss the possibility of splitting or uh, an offshoot, that can be done too. But there are two distinct groups that are reasons for educating. Mm -hmm. so, um, okay, so what? given that background, Mr. Wood, do you want to add to that? Given that background, it's uh, entirely possible that you could separate those out and be more effective. Okay, so let's start again. Which end? Uh, Mr. Heppler, please. Uh, a voice no, we haven't heard from. I'm, I'm afraid to break that streak, but I'm afraid I must. So I'm afraid to break that streak of not speaking. Oh. I'm afraid I must. Um, the, the discussion that's squarely before the committee right now is what to do with this mission statement and related materials. The issue of whether we should have a separation of the two committees would have to be, of course, noticed and undertaken at a later date because it's not noticed properly for here. You know that. We're, but we're dealing with a mission statement and you can't adopt something that was No, I was just my, I was called, called, talking to my colleague as sort of you know, I've been around the board for a while. I was going to suggest that perhaps since we had separate committees and probably in some point in time either um, developed or embraced either working concepts or a mission statement for each, I was going to suggest that we go back and see what in fact the mission statement for, if we had one for the education committee was, and then what it was for the wellness committee, and perhaps then we could present both those and then a proposed merger, if you will, of the two things and see how well they fit together. So, Dr. Levine? Yeah, uh, um, I think um, one option would be, number one, to clarify what the intention of the wellness piece is and of the education piece, and that rather that it, than expanding wellness beyond what its original intention, we're clear when we agendize items within the, the committee as to what it is we're talking about and, and who the potential beneficiaries are. And then I, I think um, Kurt's suggestion of um, looking at a mission statement that doesn't blend everything together but in fact calls out and identifies what our mission is in relationship to wellness and what our mission is in relationship to education might simplify the discussion without, you know, without requiring us to go back and, you know, and just so let me ask you a question. Looking at the statement as it is, if we were to take out the last three lines, 
starting with being of healthcare consumers, and just leave it further board's mission to, of protecting healthcare consumers, the mission of the um, Education and Wellness Committee of the Medical Board of California is to seek out and promote educational opportunities for licensees and consumers that enhance the practice of medicine, period. No, you don't have to do that. You want to add the well-being well of health. Okay, and leave the, and, and leave in, no. So Madam Chair, I think we, I think, and the Vice Council, I think we, if we need to perhaps either get both of those mission statements, look at them, and then revisit them. Okay, that's fine. Item. That's, I'm willing, I was just trying to save you some time, Instead because it's only sniffing. July and next meeting is October, so that's fine. Yes. So we're going to direct staff to bring back the mission statements of uh, both entities as they were and to pass them out in a timely fashion so that the members of the committee can review them and maybe send written comments back. Well, and perhaps when we call for items for the agenda, maybe put this on the, the agenda for an upcoming meeting. To well, absolutely, staff. absolutely. But, right. But at the same time, staff's gonna have to present that. Okay, and are there, Dr. Maybe recommendations of staff of how to, you know, taking Dr. Levine's comment of separating this and that recommendation of how they would merge it because or else we'll have the same discussion it's like you're going to have two different mission statements right you know it's a word committee that takes some time that's what we're struggling with right you presented it we all have this in our mind it's just you know mission statements just don't happen in five minutes so again we will put it on it as a agenda item regardless but i'm just suggesting the process of within the us receiving the material that it be done in a timely fashion with an opportunity to maybe send back our opinions and our comments and then from that would come forward recommendations of a possible workable statement. Is that okay? That's fine. Okay, okay so then we're going to, um, on this number eight, we're going to then table the acceptance or the approval of this mission statement. Okay? All right. Madam Chair, if I may. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. I'm presuming that if the mission statement is essentially deferred to the next meeting, consideration of any goals that would be derivative of that mission statement would be tabled as well. I think that's a good idea. Uh, no, it's not. I know. I've, I've got yes, but I've got public discussion on this okay. motion as well. Okay. So I want to um, acknowledge that if everyone at this side of the table has spoken, then I'm going to call on public comment and ask that Gary and I come forward, a former member of the Wellness Committee. Uh, please. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. And the opportunity to speak. I'm glad to hear that the deliberations are being tabled because I think this is such an important subject. Uh, and mission statements to me uh, are something that need very deep and extensive deliberations. I would hope that there will be a role of those of us who were on the Wellness Committee before to give you feedback and input about that as well. I understood that that probably was going to be arranged, but since I wasn't sure exactly the format, I wanted to be sure what, before I had to leave that uh, I think it would be uh, you know, wise, as I said, to get as much feedback as you can, particularly from those of us that served before. And I would also reiterate the statements of, uh, uh, I'm blocking on her name. Dr. Or, Greg. Dr. Greg made earlier, which I thought were very well, which was very well said. Because I think the wellness function of the medical board needs to uh, remain and hopefully uh, can promulgate those things that the previous committee tried to engender. So let me ask you a question, just, and I hate to do this because this is not the normal thing with public comment, but given that you are a previous member, yes. in your opinion, would a task force part of education be enough, or would your recommendation be what? Well, I had very little concept in terms of what, you, what your umbrella of education was going to include. So I come into that part of the discussion with kind of a blank slate in my mind. Uh, I would certainly advocate for a task force looking at the mission statement for wellness and from those comments that I've heard, certainly education is going to have to be a part of that. Okay, thank you very much. Do I have any other public comments? 
Okay, so no, thank you very much. So um, as we go forward with number eight, I think that your staff recommendations are, are excellent. You know, that it's, it's going to, it's gonna get, it's just gonna take a little longer to get there. Okay, so that, that the review and possibly revision, which is what you're recommending anyway, is going to be revised. That your review and possibly revise and adopt goals, that's going to be revised. And that you recommend that you direct staff to develop ways to implement the goals, well, you're going to implement the revision first, okay? The, the direct. And that um, to write articles, I would hold on to your articles. You can, you can, that can, you know, you can start to prepare for articles, but I, I, we're not there yet. Okay. okay? So is there any other uh, business on uh, number eight? So, um, I want to thank everyone for participating, and um, I understand it's going to be a work in progress, and as we go forward, hopefully we'll have a better, um, clearer, more um, concrete understanding of what we are expecting to achieve because outcomes and measurement of those outcomes are what are, are most important. It's uh, not the view from the 50,000 foot level, it's from the ground up in my opinion. So I want to thank everyone and I'm going to uh, accept a motion for adjournment. Well, Madam Chair, though, I do think we need to also publicly acknowledge staff and I know we grilled you and put you through a difficult discussion period and perhaps that wasn't expected that that was going to happen because I know the board had given much direction and the strategic plan and where to go. Um, but we do, we really do appreciate this and we, you know, uh, oh, yeah, hope absolutely. that this, like, the dialogue will continue. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so let's have, before we do a motion to adjourn uh, future agenda items. Uh, I, I Did we need to make an agenda item to discuss whether we'll be one committee or two? Well, I think the whole, the whole discussion needs to be exactly there. That would be definitely uh, so we have to the role and responsibilities committee. of a uh, education and wellness organization and what it should look like. But I, thought that I gave direction that that should come in advance of the meeting that we should have the opportunity to review that and revise that and send suggestions to you on that. Um, are there other um, subject matters that you want to have? I, I would think though though uh, concurrent is an update in terms of what is happening about the wellness focus also then any educational items that we think we need to to bring up. I would be very helpful again I think you had Herb Schultz here before if he could come and give an update um, about the Affordable Care Act and, the, and how it's going to impact our physician population particularly. Uh, I think that would be very helpful. So we should have an update, but we also, you also heard from me clearly that I would like to hear uh, the organizations and outreach opportunities that have existed, the um, publications and uh, organizations that you have reached out to and what the response has been, the um, ethnic diversity uh, and as well as the local um, officials that you are media sources that you've been working with and Dr. Salmonson? Well this may be moot but I think we all had some questions about that proposed um, legislation about the however you phrase that wellness bill if you will what that we may yeah, you'll get that in legislation okay so that that comes, that, come that's coming legislation no okay that comes in legislation okay um, so I think if you have, I, I think you've got a pretty full agenda opportunity for the next meeting. Yeah, okay? Thank you very much, Mr. Witt. It's been very interesting.